When it comes to Pixar, they have proven in the past that they can create an interesting variety of stories that really grab at your soul, where they can succeed either with or without villains in them. But today, we are going to solely focus on their villains and why they are mostly great in the cases that are not named cars, and what they truly add to the stories that they are involved with. The villains actually range from children to toys to everywhere in between that's more realistic than what most of Disney's mainstream has to offer. And it all started with a human kid within Toy Story. Of course, in the first Toy Story, it more focused on the relationship between Buzz and Woody where both of them really learned the value of being a toy, where Sid is actually representing the antithesis of that very value, using them as tools rather than as playthings in the case of their owner, Andy. In short, he was a sociopath who didn't regard any value for the toys, strapping them to rockets or mutilating them with twisted inventions that became shells of who they once were. It's sort of a mad doctor creating various Frankensteins out of his own sister's toys to torture them like we see what happens to Woody back and forth. His existence in the film is a heavy dose of reality for characters like Buzz about being a toy in the environment he is and also showing that not every human could be loving owners where they can all team up together to revolt against them and scar them for life that toys actually live and breathe. So basically, in short, he wasn't very big towards the overall story, but proved Pixar could actually make an effective terrifying villain being portrayed as a young adolescent boy who butchers toys rather than plays with them, one that would serve as the basis for their stories having larger than life villains, meaning mostly anthropomorphic animals with humans being the villainous foes, toys their size, and so forth that represents an obstacle or ideal that the characters have to face. And then later on, we had Bugs Life that actually introduced our first real villain in Hopper as the main antagonist for the entire story, played by the one and only infamous Kevin Spacey. This is one villain that really opposes a threat to the ants, thinking nothing of them but being lower than dirt. He is one that is manipulative and ruthless, filled with nothing but arrogance towards the ants and even his own kind where he buries them just to get what he wants, which is kind of forcing the ants to give all of them food. He uses fear to control everyone from his own kind to the ants and forces them under the will, using their numbers to his advantage when they are incapable of picking all these up for himself. And you can actually feel this within his own physical appearance that portrays this ominous big threatening figure that could destroy them if they could, to make him appear as the villain that they want to tell in that very story. But of course, when you peel back the layers, you show that he's more of a coward, using intimidation tactics to control a massive population which could overwhelm him if they tried and of course fearing things bigger than him like birds who eat grasshoppers as food, which is exactly what happens at the very end of the film. His entire villainy is relying on the bargaining of protection for the ants and the other creatures just to get what he wants, which is all held at the cost of being ruthless against everyone under him. Of course, after this, we would move back to Toy Story with our first main real toy villain this time in Stinky Pete, where in each new sequel to the Toy Story, you would see a toy represent their feelings about what happened when they didn't get played with or loved by a human. In the case of Stinky Pete, he was a toy left to rot on the shelves when kids wanted the other popular toys, slowly developing this hatred for being a toy, becoming more embittered and manipulative, who forced Woody and Jesse to join him in a place that they would last forever in the public eye, a museum to be displayed as instead of being neglected and forgotten in the case of what happened to Jesse, where he also foreshadowed their inevitable fate of how kids grow up and move beyond their own toys. But of course, in the cases of Woody and Buzz, we actually learned that it is better to live in the moment of now rather than rotting for the rest of eternity with no physical love actually being displayed behind an entire glass door like he wanted. And of course, in the realm of villainy in the 2000s, it exploded with a wide variety of stories with different villains like in Monsters Inc. with Ranto and Waternoose. These two are completely different and separate from each other, but still go against Sully in the end. In the case of Rando, he has always been second best to Sullivan at every turn and seeks an opportunity to be at the very top, while Waternoose is more of trying to keep a business afloat, a very kind and respectable gentleman towards the main characters until you see that there is some that has to go against his own plans to keep the company alive in amidst an energy crisis, an event that has to turn him villainous due to all the stress that forces him to kidnap children and to save it in the process. His actions are not of the typical villain greed that you would expect, but of the basic necessity of stress management. What happens when a boss takes too much on his plate to save his job, or he has to go on these greater lengths of degeneracy to preserve that status? Where you can see in some cases he actually shows regrets like when he had to banish Mike and Sully to fulfill his own desires because of what they provide to the company, berating Randall as well in the process because of what he did, but also being completely sane in the moment when he gets arrested for his unethical behaviors for kidnapping children just to save the entire world's power source. Well, of course, we see Randall at the end getting beaten to the pulp by an old woman in the bayou or somewhere else. Of course, moving on to villains in Finding Nemo, it took again once that Toy Story approach to humans where a little kid was the main villain in 
and Darla, who was just messing around with the fish and other sea creatures. Where overall, it's mainly using these human characters as the plot point that pulls Nemo away from Marlin and causes this journey to begin with. You may see characters like Bruce as a villain, but that's only because of his predator instincts that kick in because of the smell of blood. Because after all, and overall in his story, he's mainly a nice guy whose natural instincts just become too much to control as part of the DNA of being a shark and predator. It's just mainly in this film from the point of view of Darla, the fish she in turn see gigantic monsters who probably maybe want to eat them or torture them for pure entertainment. Basically once again becoming a major obstacle towards the story in the case of like Sid, human villains in Pixar films just lay the groundwork for the journey for our heroes to take fold. But then speaking of nothing but humans, moves us to the Incredibles with the greatest Pixar villain ever created named Syndrome. The boy who was a Mr. Incredible super fan turned super genius who wanted to completely destroy supers for good. His background comes from the adoration of heroes like many others at the start of the film who suddenly turned their backs on the heroes knowing that they caused more harm than good, only caring about saving the day for themselves rather than the whole benefit of society, which shaped what he would become in the future, using this knowledge by getting rich off of inventing various weapons for militaries across the world, then using that to experiment and research to make his own powers to release to the public later on, luring any super that was in hiding to relive their glory days and kill them off one by one, truly the darkest out of all of these foes, trying to reach back to Bob himself to get the chance of revenge for what he did to him. Most of his goals in this film are to truly replace supers by becoming one himself, using the powers he has and then selling those secrets to the public so that everyone can save the day for themselves while committing this genocide wiping out anyone who was born to powers to begin with. Also that when everyone's super, no one will eventually be and no one would have to live with others that are above them. All of this just comes out of pure spite just because Mr. Incredible rejected a single child which he shouldn't have in the very past. And all of that is just what makes his demise more special trying to become someone he's not which eventually gets him caught in that explosion in a spectacular fashion. He simply does represent a greater piece of what the Incredibles actually did. Fully utilizing humans in the story to present such adult themes for kids to learn and adults to appreciate. And to talk about the Cars villains a little bit here, they aren't very that interesting in the case of like Chick Hicks because it's more of an arrogant racer who seeks the best people like Lightning. Kind of one of those typical racing stories where the main focus is more on his experiences in Radiator Springs rather than having an overall villain to be a part of that, where the same can be said in Cars 3 with Jackson Storm taking that younger sort of role. And in Cars 2, well, um... Let's just ignore the fact that the, that was a film that existed to begin with. Because Ratatouille, instead, has to be one of my most favorite Pixar villains in Chef Skinner, the small chef of Gusto's restaurant who wants to sell frozen food to profit off of Gusto's name to keep him at that very top. The thing that makes him most interesting is the fact of how paranoid he gets seeing Remy's existence and Linguini's impeccable cooking skills, making a variety of conspiracy theories throughout the entire film that kind of sort of turns out to be true when he wants to preserve his own status as the chef of the kitchen with what Gusto left to him. Where it is also simply hilarious about the fact that this short little man goes on chasing a rat on a moped and failing in that mission because he has a letter that would ruin his entire career. Where everyone from his lawyer to the general public just looks at him as a madman where at the very end he gets tied up by rats and locked in a storage room. And moving on in the case of Wally, -E, we have this villain who is just simply following a directive he was designed to uphold. Otto acts as the true captain of this ship prevents any sort of return to Earth because of by and large his inability to keep the Earth clean and humanity's overall ability to be ignorant throughout the entire backstory of the film. The ones that kept it in space for so long until they started to change by the events of the end of the film to recapture who they once were. The real villain of this entire film is losing our humanity, represented by a robotic autopilot wheel that preserved them in this state until they actually switched them off. Not inherently bad, but an antagonist who seeks to uphold what's been put into place that allowed them to survive rather than live. And speaking more about humans, Up actually presented us with another great story that showed us the spirit of determination and adventure that Carl looked up as a kid with Charles Muntz, who attempted to find a real bird of Paradise Falls, discovering that the one he had was fake and vowed to stay in it until he found it. This is where we developed our main villain, where in that course of time, he fell to madness after years and years of searching for this damn bird, while developing communication for his various dogs to find it. It is where we see at first that he 
he is everything that Carl expected him to be, the idol of his youth where he goes seeking the prize he wanted, but when they actually do get it, it puts him into conflict with each other to fulfill his own goals by any means necessary to clear his name as a 93 year old man. I like to think this is what happens when determination gets the best of us when we go too far. Sometimes we must realize that we have to give up things for something greater in the cases of Charles where he went so far that he lost any shred of normal humanity if his goal was actually in clear view, which is what results in his own demise where he falls to his death, chasing after a simple dream, trying to kill a unique species that Russell befriended in the course of the film. And then after this, we move back once again to Toy Story with characters like Lotso where we found ourselves continuing something that Stinky Pete started, how he too thought he was left abandoned and replaced, which actually hardened his heart to take control of a daycare with an iron fist. It was something that developed in him that he thought that all the case of toys were just trash waiting to be thrown out, to play for like 2 seconds and then discarded as of nothing. The cases of Toy Story villains are those who feel like more abandoned because of how all of us simply grew up, where it was simply not the case where they just didn't get the chance to explore more of that and what they represented, where most of them just got caught up on the wrong side one day which hardened their hearts against the case for ownership and love. And of course, during the events of the film, even when other toys show caring and compassion and reasoning for the case of owners, Lotso actually rejects that ideal, letting them all die until he himself finally gets humbled to be put in front of a garbage truck left to rot with the smell of garbage and flies for all eternity until he himself actually returns to the landfill to finally meet that fate that he left the others in. Everything that he thinks about life is exactly what he gets because he rejected any sentiment or feeling of love that we would have for any toy. And of course, in talking about love, we must talk about Brave where the main big villain would be the bear who is the spirit of a prince who came long before the time of Merida and her family. But in, in the film, she mainly clashes with her mother and that sets up the whole story for the entire film, where the main villain bear was once a human who actually was led down the same path as Merida but got more violent, letting his lust for power and so forth get the best out of him which later doomed his entire family and became a bear by the events of the beginning of the film, coming into conflict with all of the humans at the very beginning where the story mainly focused on Merida and her mother who was turned into a bear where at the end she finally saves everyone and frees Mordu's spirit. The conflict he causes here is to serve as the tension between the family and the lessons that they needed to learn because of that consequences that he first started. Of course, after this, most of the stories started to vary with the types of villains that they wanted to present. Ones that aren't as interesting as the past ones represented them, where most of these new stories actually appeared in sequels or just having stories that lacked any villains. And of course, that mainly isn't a problem for the entire studio of course, but it doesn't always work like the cases that Disney tries to keep convincing itself it does. And some of these villains range from using the same ones in Monsters University because it's a prequel and of course to sort of capture a mediocre version of the first villain in The Incredibles. It's just that in this case, every sequel or adaptation that is not Toy Story doesn't really have great villains to serve as stories because the stories themselves mostly lack what the original provided us after so many years of release. But still during this time, they still also proved they still had that touch with stories like Coco, with Ernesto de la Cruz being the most famous musician in this film's world, serving as the inspiration for Miguel whose journey starts with him leading to first believe that he is related to him until he finds out otherwise that Ernesto's best friend Hector was that kind of guy, revealing this relationship where he wrote the songs and they played together where he wanted to go home after and instead poisoned him and stole all of his work trying to become the famed musician that he was, a vain selfish man who wanted glory at the cost of others. Nothing he does in this film is out of passion for the art of music but out of the popularity that actually results from it, thinking nothing more but retaining his image in the public until he gets exposed for the fraud that he is. He cares more about the fame and glory rather than the passion that Miguel and his family had for music. Of course, as you can see, Pixar villains mainly represent more real human elements compared to most of the mainstream Disney counterparts, taking in more the material tangible elements that come from the places of hurt or other emotional places that we experience, rather than basking in simply being evil for the sake of it until we talk about some of the other characters. I mean, they do show some of the elements of relishing evil in some scenes, but for the most part, the Pixar stories takes everything more serious for its audience and for its villains and its heroes, something that clearly makes them unique amongst the others in else in animation and likewise. And of course, currently, I've had my problems with the type of charm that they've been lacking recently, and I just hope they don't create more stories in vain of what Light Lightyear presents, ruining the whole entire purpose or depth that these characters had to begin with, where I just want them to go back to what made them special at the start. And with that said, this has been my shitty love letter to them, and that's all I really have to add, so goodbye.